I want to shoot it over to uh, Ms. Tiana williams Clausen to introduce herself. Welcome, Atla Ma. Thank you, Kate. I will allow for the invitation to be here. I'm so honored to, to talk today. Um, as Kate said, my name is Tiana williams Clausen, and I'm director of the Yurok Tribe. Uh, wildlife department and I come from the village of Wekwelp which some may be familiar with it's it's where we have our uh, annual brush dances down at the mouth of the Klamath on the south side. I've lived in the area for pretty much my entire life except for that brief stint where I, I went off to college but always with the goal of coming home to serve my community. So I'm going to go ahead and try and share my PowerPoint. Oh no I've got host disabled participant sh screen sharing. I should have checked that. Um, is that something that we can fix? Should be all set now. Okay. Let's try that again. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, always the fun little um, last minute Zoom snafus. Okay, share screen. Where is my, there it is. Okay. Can, you all see in full screen presenter mode? Hopefully it looks good. Okay. So what I'm happy to talk about is the idea of that we take care of each other and how that has played out with what's been pretty much my life's work um, for the Iraq tribe, which is California condor recovery in Northern California in our tribal territories up here. So I know that there's people tuning in from everywhere. Um, if you're local, you're probably familiar with this information, but you may not be too. So I just want to do a bit of an introduction to who we are as a tribal people. Um, so the kind of large red boundary that you see here is our ancestral territory, the lands that we traditionally lived with in relationship and helped caretake and which took care of us. The thinner orange boundary that you see in the middle is the Yurok Reservation. And it's one mile on either side of the Klamath River going from the mouth um, up to the confluence, basically to the confluence with the Trinity River, about 44 river miles. Now it's only about 10% of our ancestral territory and it's kind of where our, our current and modern jurisdictional authority is where we can pass laws or, or manage according to traditional paradigms. But despite it only being one tenth of our traditional territories, we still maintain our traditional relationship with the whole of traditional territories and our obligation to be caretakers of the whole of it. So, that obligation could probably be summed up in what we consider our primary reason for being. And this isn't just a Yurok thing, it's Karuk and Hupa and Wea and Cholula and Talawa, all the tribes you can name in this area and expanding outwards, consider themselves to be world renewal people, or another way we say it is fix the earth people. And I really love this piece of art by our local artist, Lynn Risling, who's I believe of Karuk, Yurok and Hupa descents, which depicts some of our world renewal ceremonies, our highest of ceremonies, particularly uh, for the Yurok tribe and for Karuk and, and some of these shared tribes, this, this is the white deerskin dance and the jump dance or lifting up dance. And these are ceremonies which help keep our world in renewal. So historically that would have been a matter of caretaking and maintaining a robust and healthy balance that we had co-evolved with since time began, in modern times with the destruction that we faced of our local homes, it's a lot of restoration work. But ultimately, what it comes down to is balancing relationships. So when I say we're world renewal people who are seeking to restore balance, that's fundamentally what I would call our traditional ecological knowledge. A lot of folks may come into our communities looking for facts or information about a system. Oh, this animal lives here or eats these foods or what have you. And that's certainly a part of it. But more comprehensively, it's about how everything exists in relationships. And so here I love this schematic that uh, Dr. Sifa Ramos allowed me to borrow, which really exemplifies that we are interconnected in a whole bunch of ways. And so when I'm talking about balance, I'm not just talking about kind of that physical or ecological balance, though an extremely important part, but also the spiritual balance. And with the recognition that the spirit is not just a human thing, but encompasses everything that exists in this world. And so in English, these ideas are a little bit disparate. You've got the physical, you've got the spirit, and we tend to kind of separate the two. But that's not the way in traditional ecological knowledge. And so when I say, we take care of the world, that word, 
means everything that you can imagine inside the world, physical, ecological, spiritual, cultural, all of these things come together in balance. So obviously I'm the director of the wildlife department. I tend to focus my attention on wildlife. You can see in the schematic that Yurok people are in the center, but it's not to depict that humans are central to this, but rather that we're integrated into this, not external and not hierarchically above it, which sometimes the Western world can view us as. And so to be in relationship means to be in bi-directional support of each other, of course. And so while it's obvious the ways that wildlife can contribute to our lives, uh, both traditionally and in modern day, through food, through clothing, through materials, by them giving of themselves in that way, we are obligated as Yurok people to take care of them and to respect them, recognizing them as spiritually valuable people as well. So that plays out as things like physical landscape management, uh, for example, our traditional burns, which for a long time were prohibited, but kept a very strong and healthy balance within our forested and, and prairie landscapes in which we're reincorporating now through a lot of really great work out there on the ground. It meant that when we harvested animals, we did it according to cultural protocols that recognized their value as equal or even sometimes, um, I guess I would say wiser or, or perhaps better people than we are, always respectfully, always making sure to utilize things in the appropriate way and fully so that they, their sacrifice is fully recognized. But then both of us contributing to the spiritual well-being as well. They, through the spirit that they contribute to our regalia, us through these ceremonies that we dance to keep the world in balance or our own selves or themselves in balance, all kind of mixing and melding into this very complicated web where everyone has a role and a responsibility and meets that need. And so that is what I'm going to talk about now, specifically how Condor or Preganish in the Iraq language ties into this integrate, integrated web. And so I'll say in Yurok believe condor is one of the highest of the animals in a couple of ways. Uh, one being, I would say, spiritually speaking, because he's considered to be a very strong and kind hearted and powerful spiritual being. And that's the kind of energy that he brings to our world renewal ceremonies. Um, so our relationship goes back to the beginning of time before humans were really even the people of the world, you might say, when it was the animals or the spirits of the world who were designing how we would move forward in balance. And so they developed these world renewal ceremonies at that time to which Condor actually gave a song which carries his spirit um, for which he provides his feathers and through them his spirit to the dance. Um, he actually flies higher than any other animal in our region. And so we believe that he can soar the highest. And so we figured that was the one to get our prayers to heaven when we were asking for the world to be in balance. That's according to Richard, Richard Myers, who's a former Yurok councilman and cultural leader. And so many Yurok families like myself teach that he's never to be harmed and any feathers are considered to be gifts. The different families teach different things. But he actually went extinct locally well over a hundred years ago at this point. And so there's been a very deep ecological and cultural hole in the Yurok world and for many of the tribal peoples around us who also consider Condor very sacred. In and of himself, he's just a super cool bird. He's actually the largest land-based bird in North America with a wingspan of nine to nine and a half feet. He can weigh as much as 25 pounds and he has a very long lifespan. Um, we actually don't know how long they can live because we haven't been studying them long enough, but based on birds living in captivity, birds we've seen in the wild and their, their cousins, the Andean condor, we would expect at least 60 plus years for condors in the wild. The role that they play is that of a giant obligate scavenger. And so an obligate scavenger is, is in this case, a, a vulture, a very large vulture, but it means that he only eats things that are already dead on the ground, things that many animals even wouldn't necessarily eat or wouldn't be able to get into. Because one strong thing that he brings to the picture is he's a very large bird with a very large bill and powerful bill. So he can break into the very large carcasses that our smaller scavengers like turkey vultures or ravens just don't have the power to access. So when you're walking along the beach, for example, and you see these old bloated carcasses of like sea lions and the like that are just sitting there, these guys are the guys who are going to come in and tear into it, not only feeding themselves, but making the food more bioavailable to the broader scavenging community. And so really they kind of exemplify that renewal spirit by going out and literally cleaning up the landscape. 
But one of the things that I really love about condors as both a tribal member and as a tribal biologist is that condor is an indicator and a driver for change. So he tells us when things are wrong and he helps us make things better. And I'll go into that. But for a little bit of history and what and kind of the context of this, he's a very adaptable bird. He actually lives in a huge variety of, of different sorts of ecosystems. And prehistorically, 20,000 years ago or so, he went all the way up into what's now British Columbia, down into what's now Mexico, across what's now the United States and up into New York. So he had a very expansive range. By the time that the 1850s rolled around, there was a lot of new pressures on the birds and their range had shrunk to kind of this brown shape that you see here, still going up to British Columbia and down to Baja California, but much reduced towards the West, uh, mostly existing just on the Western coast. By the 1950s, their range had shrunk to just this red wishbone that you see in Central California. And in fact, their decline was so bad that by the 1980s, there was only 22 individuals left in the entire world, making them pretty much the most endangered bird species out there at the time. And unfortunately, that had to do, as many of these things do, with human impacts. So particularly on the West Coast, particularly for us after the California Gold Rush, there was a lot more human impact than, than tribal people could have done on their worst days even. There's a huge influx of more people. There was an entire shift in how people integrated with wildlife in the system. It was very extractive versus relationship-based. But so things that impacted condors included reduction in megafauna. So those, those kind of large game that they rely on. Um, so deer, elk, bear, whales, and sea lions. Uh, there was direct human take where people would kill them for profit or because they thought they were cool or because uh, they were scared of them. Very large bird people had this idea that they could pick up your kids and fly away, which they absolutely cannot do. Uh, there was habitat loss as people um, saw the land as something to get resources out of. For us locally, that meant the loss of our old growth redwoods, which they relied on for, for new roosting and nesting, and the loss of our prairies, which we had maintained since time immemorial, and that along with the coast being their primary uh, foraging sites. There was poisoning where people would put out carcasses for carnivores that they didn't want, like wolves or bears, but condors would eat. And there's three issues which remain an issue, which is micro trash. You can see a picture of that off on the far right. That's those little bits of metal and glass that just kind of seem to end up everywhere, plastic. Um, they're finding, particularly with birds in the wild, um, post reintroduction, um, that they would go and find these little bits of glass and metal and actually feed it to their chicks. And we think that we think that they were thinking that they were feeding their chicks bone chips, which is a very natural sort of thing. But then the chicks would ingest it, their, their systems would get impacted and without intervention, they would die. Um, there's also DDT contamination. Some people maybe I'll talk more about this, but DDT was a pesticide that causes um, eggshell thinning in a huge variety of birds, including condors. And there's actually the biggest problem for condors today, which is lead toxicity, which um, lead ammunition has actually been implicated as the primary source of lead contamination for condors in the wild and has been known to cause as much as 50% of known mortality in the wild um, for birds as they go about their business. So what I'm talking about as an indicator for change is obviously all of these things heavily impacted condors and they left our lands uh, over a hundred years ago. Um, the last really confirmed sighting was around the turn into the, the 20th century. But a lot of these things that impacted them also impacted us as tribal people. So this reduction in megafauna meant an overharvest of or exclusion from our traditional foods, making us reliant on unhealthy foods and not allowing us the healthful activity that goes along with harvest that kept us in good health. Um, there was direct human take of those birds. Similarly, there was massacres and the theft of our children into the boarding schools and a very concerted effort to eradicate us. And I think both for the birds and for us, it's because we were considered lesser beings. And so it was not a big deal to commit these atrocities. There was habitat loss. There was removal from our homeland, which not only hurt us, but hurt our homeland. And then there was an introduction of a whole host of toxic elements. Uh, for us, it was things like alcohol, diseases, et cetera, which, which still continue to impact our communities today. Basically, 
the condor was an indicator that there was this huge change that just wrecked our world in a lot of ways in which we're, we're working hard to, to restore and, and fix at this point in time. But so one of the primary things that we wanted to address was a feasibility of analysis to ensure that when condors came home, that this was actually a good move for condors, because though we know we loved them, we didn't want to do something that was bad for them. So some primary questions that we asked are, is there available habitat for condors to carry out necessary life history activities? Will marine mammal derived organochlorine contaminant levels, so these organochlorine contaminants are that DDTO is talking about, limit recovery in Northern California? Will lead limit recovery in Northern California? And knowing that it's often tied to use of lead ammunition, what are the attitudes of Northern California hunters and will they accept non-lead ammunition as a viable alternative? So is there available habitat for condors to carry out necessary life history? In short, Yes, and that's because of what I referenced earlier, their great adaptability. So long as they can get from point A to point B, they can fly anywhere from 100 to 200 miles in a day. And our homeland is full of canyons and riverways and mountainways and coastline, all of which come along with some beautiful wind, which these large birds need to get around. So this, for example, is a map of the corridors. All of the green and blue are the really good flight corridors for these birds. They can get from point A to point B and they can find what they need so long as it's in six, it's enough abundance. And so with the conservation changes of the, two, of the 20th century, including um, keeping some of our old growth redwoods safe, um, restoring prairies and things like that, uh, limiting harvest of animals so that their populations can rebound, condors are looking good in that respect. In terms of DDT, what we did was looking at our local marine mammal populations, animals that had died on our shores. Uh, DDT is a, a uh, lipophilic chemical, so it's a fat binding molecule that bioaccumulates in long-lived and blubbery animals, say for example, California sea lions. This is a harbor seal here. And while we didn't have too much concern over contamination coming from our area, we did have concern for, for long-lived and long-ranging animals like the sea lion to go to more contaminated areas, bioaccumulate, come back to our shores and die, thus bringing DDT into our system. And so the problem with DDT is it causes eggshell thinning. So this is a healthy egg and it has what's called the surface crystalline layer, which offers strength and integrity and water retention to the egg. But this is an example of an egg actually from the Central California flock where they have a problem with DDT. And that surface crystalline layer is completely absent. That means that the egg is brittle, that will lose water, and that even with intervention, it is likely to be lost. So that impinges on their reproductive capacity. Now, something I didn't mention before is that condors actually only have one chick every year. They form lifelong pair bonds they are really good parents, and they put a lot of attention into making sure that their, their young survive. But when you have low reproduction because of this sort of thing, and you can only have one chick every two years, every egg lost is a really big deal when it comes to overall population health. The good news for us is that there's a very clear downward trend in contamination if you go from south to north. So if you look at that blue bar in the middle, that's actually Central California, where they do have something of a problem still. The good news for them is about 50% of their eggs survive without intervention. So they are on the upward trend of positive reproduction without intervention. And DDT was banned for use in the 1970s. So that's only going to get better. We're about four times lower than they are in terms of DDT. I can't say that means we won't have a problem, but I'm very hopeful that if we have a problem for reproduction, it's gonna be very minimal. So that was great news. The last and the biggest issue is lead contamination, which I referenced before. And so this is actually an example of a deer that was harvested with lead ammunition. And while very effective, it's the way that lead ammunition works um, actually kind of, uh, I don't wanna say infests because that seems like too strong of a word, but the thing about lead is it's a soft metal. And so upon impact with an animal, it will actually break into hundreds of pieces. And all of these little shiny bits you see here is remnants from a lead bullet, specifically a seven millimeter Remington mag, um, lead core, lead tip, 175 grain uh, ammunition round. 
There's actually 547 fragments of lead counted in this radiograph, this X-ray alone. And a piece as small as the head of a pin is enough to kill a condor. They're messy eaters. You know, they're not going through and picking out these little bits of lead. And even some of it is just micro dust. So they couldn't even if they wanted to. The problem is when this stuff gets into a gut pile that a hunter will leave behind. And this is completely unintentional on the hunter's part. Gut piles are actually a really important way that hunters contribute to our ecosystem, especially with the imbalance of carnivores that we see these days. We are an apex predator and we provide food for scavengers. The problem comes when they've been uh, filled with this lead contamination, which is so toxic, not only for condors, but for things like bald and golden eagles as well. So it's, it's a much broader ecosystem problem. And as we somewhat expected, we did see a problem here because it is the most conventionally used material. And so the way that we looked at studying it was through um, assessment of local scavengers who still lived here, the turkey vultures and common ravens who eat a similar diet to condors to see if they were getting lead ingested. And so we're the bar on the far left there. And so 24% of our turkey vultures were found to have elevated lead levels at a level that would be harmful for a condor. So if you look at this graph, our bar is specifically for hunting or excuse me, for birds tested outside of the hunting season. And the two bars to the middle and to the, to the right are actually a similar study that was done in Mendocino in which they did both inside and outside of deer hunting. And so the red bar in the middle is outside of deer hunting. So there's no lead ammunition theoretically being added to the system. The one on the right that's much larger, almost doubled is lead contamination in their turkey vultures during the hunting season. So there's a clear increase that correlates with lead ingestion for these birds within the hunting season, indicating that probably lead is contributing to, lead ammunition uh, for hunting is contributing to our problem. So the good news here is that we had 24% of our birds contaminated compared to say 36% outside of the hunting season. So it's, it's continuing to be a problem outside of the hunting season, but less of one. But the 24% is actually lower than any place else studied with turkey vultures. But the fact that hunting was still being a problem in our area um, is shown by this graph. You can see on this side where on the right, the orange bar is the non-hunting season and the, the blue bar is the hunting season. And this was a study done in common ravens. Now we couldn't do the inside of hunting season, the outside of hunting season with the turkey vultures because they're migrating during the hunting season. So any contaminant analyses you do there, you don't know if the birds are actually picking it up here or from someplace else. But ravens are non-migratory and we saw a very clear increase in lead contamination again in the hunting season, which led us to develop what we called our Hunters as Stewards project, originally really focusing on our tribal communities because hunting is such an important part of our way of life, both as a way to be in relationship with wildlife, but also to feed our families. And the idea behind Hunters as Stewards, um, which eventually expanded to the much broader community, is to reach out to the deep conservation ethic that many hunters have, because they're the people who want to be in a healthy and abundant ecosystem. They're the people who enjoy the outdoors. Let them know what the issue is. Let them know that there's alternatives, non-lead ammunition, primarily copper, and answer any questions that they may have and, and ask them to join in partnership with Gondor Conservation by making a voluntary switch to non-lead alternatives. And we had an amazing amount of success in the work that we've done so far with anywhere from 85 to 95% of the hunters we talked to being willing to make the switch once they learned about this, because many of them had no idea that this was an issue. So coming, being a hunter and coming from a hunting community, um, that didn't surprise me a ton, but it was still really encouraging to see that there were so many people who were willing to partner um, for condor conservation. If anybody's interested, there's a really great website, huntingwithnonlead.org, that has the science and the conservation and, you know, a lot of facts for hunters. How do you make this transition as well? And that's one of the primary ways that we ask people to help condors is if you're a hunter or there's hunters in your families to make that transition to non-lead. But so we took this kind of partnership building approach from the very beginning with a whole host of folks, because as you all remember, they can fly as much as 200 miles in a day. So it's not just us who's going to be managing condors. But ultimately, this resulted in a memorandum of understanding amongst 16 partners, tribal, federal, state, nonprofit, industry, utility companies, all kinds of folks in our area, 
all agreeing that not only would it be a benefit to condors to bring them home to the region, but the region would benefit from having condors be brought home. And that sort of approach has just really helped us the whole way and, and overcome a whole host of seemingly insurmountable issues that have come up. Um, one of the last steps that we had been working on for the last six years was undergoing the regulatory requirements was the environmental assessment that any federally endangered species has to be uh, managed under. Um, but also we're looking to release them with our on um, Redwood National Park land. And so Redwood National State Parks has been a huge partner since the very beginning. And so we'll actually be releasing them into Redwood National Park land within Yurok Ancestral Territory. And because it's a federal landscape, we have to do this EA as well. Took a really long time. It took six years to get through this, but we finally got what's called the finding of no significant impact in March of 23, 2021, which was kind of our, um, our go ahead to get started on this project. I don't think I said in the very beginning, but we've been working on this for almost 20 years. We really got started with our tribal park task force, which is a panel of our elders who were specifically tasked with identifying cultural and natural resource restoration and who identified Preganish condor as the single most important species to bring back to your country based on our cultural importance to us. Um, that was all the way back in 2003. We really got rolling on this as a government in 2008. So I've been working on this for almost 15 years now. Um, and we're finally coming to fruition. But what this finding of no significant impact allowed us to do was to start building the infrastructure that we needed to bring condors home. So on the left, you actually see a picture of what's gonna be our release and management facility, or rather what is, it's been fully built now. All kinds of folks came in to help make that happen, not just us, but parks folk, our watershed crew, um, our tarot crew really helped in taking this picture on the far right, of, of trash and dilapidation. There was a building that was loaned to us by the parks, which was slated for demolition, but which has been completely revamped to the picture in the middle to be our, our primary office and operations. Um, a lot of work has been going into this to make this happen. And we actually finished building all of our facilities, I think the third week of March um, and received our first birds the very next week. Um, and these are actually birds that are going to be released into the wild. The picture on the top right is of two of our, our young birds that we're going to be releasing. There's four in total. Um, you can see A3 and A2. They've all got kind of alphanumeric visual tags so that we can identify them in the field um, in the top right. And then you can actually see A0 and A1 a little bit in the bottom left. So we actually received those birds on March 28th, and we're hoping that we're going to be releasing them within the next two weeks, which would be absolutely incredible. We've also um, had the privilege of receiving a mentor bird, number 746. He comes from the Boise World Center of Birds of Prey, uh, which is run by the Paragon Fund. And he's an adult bird who unfortunately can't be released. Um, so when condors went into their population nosedive, there's actually a really, at the time, controversial decision made to bring all birds into captivity in the hopes of starting a captive rearing probe and program and, and revitalizing their population. It was actually wildly successful, um, deeply managed because we were down to just 14 genetic lines uh, by the time we brought these birds. So every single bird is managed for its lineage, um, even to today. Um, and, but which ultimately resulted in these sort of releases happening. So there's existing release facilities in Central California run by the Ventana Wildlife Society and Pinnacles National Park. There's a release facility in Southern California run by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And there's a release facility in the Arizona, Utah area run by the Peregrine Fund. We're gonna be the newest of those in 19 years. But so our birds actually are juvenile birds. They're about two to three years old fully flight capable, but they come from these captive rearing programs and um, have actually never been out in the wild. And so this mentor bird, long story long, um, he can't be released because he's actually very genetically valuable. He contributes to keeping the population going. And so after he leaves us, he's going to return to Boise and, and become a part of the breeding population. He's just now old enough at, I think, eight years old. But while he's here, he is going to teach our young ones kind of those last finishing touches of what it means to be an adult condor, how to 
interact appropriately with each other, how to respond to things that might be frightening, um, when to be calm. They're taking their cues from him basically to kind of get that last bit of comfort level before we release them out the door. I'm just about wrapped up here. Um, like I said, we're looking at releases in the next couple of weeks, which is amazing. This is literally what I've been doing for my entire life. But I'd like to throw in there that this was just kind of the start of the Yurok Tribe Wildlife Department. We got started with that feasibility analysis in 2008. But since then, we've expanded um, all the way to um, other threatened and endangered species monitoring and management and conservation. Uh, for example, Humboldt Martin, um, Wapaya rocks you see there, and Northern Spotted Owl and Marbled Merlet, all of whom are also on the threatened and endangered species list. We're doing invasive species removal. We're actually getting, people always kind of laugh a little bit, but we're getting feral cows out of your tribal lands. These are cows that their managers or owners uh, lost capacity to manage through shifting um, land ownership and things like that. Gates got put up, people couldn't manage their cows anymore, but they're tromping around and, and, and breaking up our, our creeks and our prairies and all that sort of stuff. So we've been actually removing them and then passing the meat to our elders and community members we're working towards active landscape restoration with the rest of the natural resource department. So reestablishing prairies, making forests healthier, bringing back species that maybe even aren't threatened or endangered, but which aren't abundant on tribal lands. For example, the Mewit or the, the Roosevelt elk that you see on the bottom. And we've gone from what was a two person crew of myself and our, our now condor program manager, Chris West, to now a crew of about 16, uh, meeting a diversity of restoration needs for our region. And condor was the starting point for that. Ultimately, our long term version or vision is that not only will condors you know, thrive in our area, but may actually expand into the Pacific Northwest. Um, we'll be releasing four to six birds every year for the next 20 years, ultimately resulting in about 120 birds that have been released into our region. And we've done habitat analyses as, as a broader program, kind of seeing where there's still extant good condor habitat. And we think that they're gonna expand northward up into the Pacific Northwest, um, where we know that they traditionally lived as well. So really we see Northern California as just kind of the next phase of condor recovery, representing a gateway into the Pacific Northwest, as well as recovery in Northern California. Ultimately, of course, our goal is to have birds without tags that don't have to be managed anymore and are just healthy and abundant, playing the role that they historically have played in coordination with a whole host of healthy and abundant populations, all playing the role that, that we had evolved to play. So with that, I will say wachlau. Thank you very deeply from my heart for listening. Uh, that was a lot of information in a relatively short time period. So I'll be here for questions. But then also we have our website at yuroktribe.org slash wildlife and also our condor restoration program Facebook page, um, which you can see the link for there.